6.2 volumes. This section is honestly one of my favorite to teach. It is a little intimidating at first because it's the first time we really go into 3D and we need to look at this solid that's revolving around an axis and it looks really intimidating. But what I need you to keep in mind is that it is one of my favorite sections. It's one of my favorite things to teach because it's really simple if you think about it the right way. If you think about what does it look like when we're revolving and you let yourself get intimidated by all that, it, it might end up being your least favorite section. But don't let that happen. We're going to have fun with it. So first of all, what is volume? What do we mean by the volume of a solid? How do we know that the volume of a sphere with a radius of r is 4 thirds pi r cubed? How can we give a precise definition of volume? First of all, we know, for example, a circular cylinder has a volume pi r squared h. Because basically what you're doing is you're taking the area of the base and you're multiplying it by the height. A rectangular box is the same kind of thing. You take the area of the base, which is the width times the length, and you multiply it by the height to get the volume. What about if the base of the cylinder is not a circle? We can use our knowledge of cylinders to cut our cylinder into parallel thin slices. Treat each piece as though it were a cylinder and add the volumes of the pieces. So the way I like to think of it is this way. If you're thinking of an apple, how would we find the volume of an apple, for instance? Well, if I took that apple and I sliced it into really, really thin pieces, and I just found the area of each of those slices of the apple, which I could do by just finding the area, and then the width would be very tiny, almost nothing, as small as possible, and I added up all those slices together, I would be getting a volume. Another way to think of it is a loaf of bread. You slice the loaf of bread into a bunch of pieces. You can easily find the area of each of those slices and then add them all up. It doesn't matter what your loaf looks like and you'll have the volume. This leads to the method of finding volumes by cross sections. And the cross section is just like one slice of the apple or one slice of the loaf of bread. Of course, it's going to depend where you are in the apple or where you are in the loaf of bread. That is going to affect the volume you get at that little point there. So here's just an illustration. This one looks kind of like a slice of bread to me. So we just make these slices. Usually we're going to make them perpendicular to the x-axis, so they're dx slices, I will call them. Call the cross-sectional area A of x, so that's just the area of the cross-section that I'm taking. A of x will vary as x increases from A to B. And you divide S slabs of equal width, delta x, x1, x2, all the way up to x sub n. The ith slab is roughly a cylinder with volume A x sub i star times delta x. All that's saying is the area of the x i slab times delta x is going to give us a volume. Then we're going to add up all of those areas and we're going to get the volume. So we're going to use more and more slabs. In other words, let n approach infinity. The more slabs that you put in there, the closer the volume is going to be to the actual volume. So we can say the volume is the limit as n approaches infinity as we get infinite number of slabs of these areas times the height of the little slab. In other words, we just formalize it. The summation is just an integral from a to b of all my areas. We've now formalized the volume as the antiderivative of the area. So in example one, we're going to actually show that the area of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. In order to do this, we're just going to use what we found here, that the volume is the antiderivative of the area. So what do we know? Here's our little cross section right here, and we're using delta x slices. The volume is antiderivative from negative r to r of whatever the area is, dx. Now, what is our area? 
So let's just say the area of our little cross section is our radius we see is y. So our area is pi y squared. However, since I'm using all x stuff here, I must express this in terms of x's in order to put it in here. So what is the relationship that I know? Well, this is a circle, so I know here I have x squared plus y squared equals r squared is the equation of the circle that I have. In other words, y squared equals r squared minus x squared. So I can substitute in for y squared, r squared minus x squared. So I'm just going to use this. And just here, since I see symmetry, I'm just going to say this is the same thing as 2 times the integral from 0 to r. Remember we can do that? It's not necessary, but it will make our life easier. So let's just go ahead and factor this pi out too, since it's a constant. And then we'll take the antiderivative. Well, r squared is just a constant, so the antiderivative is r squared x minus one-third x cubed. So let's put an r in, so we get r squared times r minus one-third r cubed minus, stick in a zero, and we'll just get zero minus zero. there you go, you get 4 thirds pi r cubed. We just proved that the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. How cool is that? Now we're going to talk about revolving over an axis. So I might ask you, take the equation y equals root x and revolve it about the x-axis. So I'll just usually illustrate it like this, revolve it about the x-axis. What kind of figure do you get? Well, you take that and you revolve it around the x-axis and you end up with this figure here. And we're going to find the volume of that figure. When we do these, the slabs are always in one of two shapes. Either the shape of a disk, and so that's what we just saw here, because when we revolve this, we're going to get this shape, the cross section is going to look like a disk, or the shape of a washer. A washer is just when we have a hollowed out region inside. If I was revolving this figure about the x-axis like this, then I'm going to have this region in the inside that's hollowed out, right? This region in the middle is hollowed out because I'm just revolving this over the axis, revolve it around like that. And so if I look at my cross section, it's going to look like a washer. So those are the only two methods we need to know. This is the washer and this is the disk. So if we do just go ahead and find the volume of the solid obtained by rotating about the x-axis, the region under the curve, y equals root x from x equals 0 to x equals 1, how do we do this? Well, all I do is I think I need to find the area of this little cross section here. And I need to sum them all up. I need to sum them all up from 0 to 1. And what is this cross section here? Well, I know the radius of this would just be root x because it's coming from here. So that's the radius, and it's just revolving. So I have now made a circle with the radius of root x. And so my area is just pi r squared. I want to add up all of the areas. And so that's all I do. I'm going to pull the pi out because it's a constant. Root x squared is just x. I'm evaluating it now. And so I get one-half 
pi. In this example, I want to find the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by y equals x cubed, y equals 8, and x equals 0 about the y-axis. Notice that the little slice they've given us here is a dy slice. I'm adding up the slices this way. I'm adding up the slices from 0 to 8 and they're all dy slices, meaning everything I have here must be in terms of y. So now I'm rotating this about the y-axis. The reason I know that I want to use dy slices, even if they didn't give me the um, slices, is because I always need my slices to be perpendicular to the axis that I'm rotating about. So you probably want to take a note of that somewhere, that the slices must be perpendicular to the axis you're rotating about. So in the last example, it was rotating about the x-axis, so my slices should have been dx slices, but here I'm rotating about the y-axis, so my slices must be dy slices. So, now I'm doing the right curve. This is my radius. I just look at my radius. The right curve minus the left curve. Okay, so what is the height of this? Well, I definitely need it in terms of x. And so my height is just y to the one-third minus zero. So this radius is y to the one-third. My little circle here, since I'm rotating, I'm getting another disk is pi r squared. Factor out the pi. Now evaluate. Add 1. So I get 3 fifths, that's 2 to the fifth is 32. And that's my answer. In order to find the volume of the solid obtained by rotating about the x-axis, so I'm rotating about the x-axis, the region enclosed by the curves y equals x, so this is y equals x, and y equals x squared. All right. I know I'm going between 0 and 1. That's my enclosed region. Now, here is my little cross-section. How do I find that area? What I'm basically going to do, and now I honestly, I don't bog myself down with these pictures, but I will use this one for explanation right now in saying that in order to find the area of the shaded region, I'm going to take the outer one, so I'm going to just call that the area of the outer circle minus the area of the inner circle. That's going to give me the pink shaded region, right? In order to find the area of the outer region, I need the radius of the outer region. This is the radius of the outer region. In other words, it is just, since it's my y equals x curve, the radius outer is just x. In order to find the radius of my inner region, that is just the curve y equals x squared, so that's just going to be x squared. The area I want to find is the area of the outer minus the area of the inner. So what I'll do is the radius of the outer region is just pi r squared minus the radius of the inner region is just pi r squared. This is the area of the outer region minus the area of the inside region.
let's just factor a pi out since we can. And I usually do that right off the bat. I usually set it up as the volume equals pi times the integral of radius outer squared minus radius inner squared because I can just factor that pi out. But you can think about it however you want. And so we get pi one third x cubed minus one fifth x to the fifth between zero and one. One third minus one fifth or two pi over fifteen. And that's my answer. So y equals root x is drawn, and now we'll draw in y equals one-tenth x, and we're going to bound that region with x equals 4. So the red is our region that we are revolving around the x-axis. See there, our shape. And if we take this little slice that we're talking about, it looks like this washer. And so that's the washer method we are talking about. And so in essence, what we're doing is this radius outer and then subtracting the radius inner out to hollow our final shape. In order to find the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the same region as in the preceding example, but we want to rotate about the line y equals 2 instead of the x-axis. How in the world are we going to do that? Well, remember in the last example, we had two curves, and they're just right here. Now, remember I said to you I never draw this 3D shape? So how do I draw it? I just draw it like this. Okay, I had y equals x and I had y equals x squared. And so I want to rotate about the line now y equals 2. Now when I go to do this, I'm going to look at my radiuses. Here's one of them, and here's another one because my radius is always going to go to axis that I want to rotate about. So in the last example here, you know, I was rotating about the x-axis, so I just made my line from my curve to the x-axis, from my curve to the x-axis. And the outer radius is just always the longer line. So going back here, now this is going to be my outer radius because it's a longer line. And this is going to be my inner radius. Now, what is my outer radius? Well, how would you find, if I was asking you, between y equals 2 and y equals 5, let's say, if I asked you to go ahead and find this radius, how would you do it? You would just do the top curve minus the bottom curve. In other words, you would do 5 minus 3 in order to find that length. So the same thing goes on here. In order to find this length here, I just do my top minus my bottom. So my top in this case is 2 minus, this was y equals x squared, so it's going to be 2 minus x squared. And the smaller line is just 2 minus x. So you'll see that my radius in or my radius outer change from the last example. So don't try and memorize which one is which. You just have to draw the picture and see which line is longer. So in order to find this one, my volume is going to be, I'm going to factor out the pi for this one so I don't get confused. My slices are still just going from 0 to 1 because I'm just adding up all of the slices from 0 to 1. Right? That's my area and I want to revolve it. But now my radius outer is this, and my radius inner is this, and that's it. I've just done the hardest part, setting it up. Remember, simplify before you take any antiderivatives.
So I have an x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 4x. And the 4 minus the 4 goes away. Now I'm evaluating. between 0 and 1. So I'm left with 8 pi over 15. So remember, when doing these, to me, I never draw in 3D. I'm not really good at that. I just look at it in 2D, make my lines, and I see which one's longer. The longer one's the outer radius. The shorter one is the inner radius. And that's about it. Find the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the region in example 4. I'm still dealing with my y equals x and my y equals x squared curves, but now I'm rotating about x equals negative 1. So let me just draw it. I'm going to rotate about this line, x equals negative 1. And... So now, I want to rotate about this axis. So again, I need perpendicular slices. So since I'm rotating about the y axis, I'm going to need y slices. So here's one radius. I could do right minus left. And here's another one. And so my outer radius better put these in terms of x. So this is just x equals y, and this is just x equals y to the one-half. Took the square root of both sides. So this radius is just the right curve minus the left curve. So I get y to the one-half minus a minus one. In other words, y to the one-half plus one. And this radius is just going to be a y minus a minus 1. Okay, again, keep in mind, if I had asked you, okay, let's go at x equals 1, 2, 3, um, and x equals negative 1, and I asked you the distance between these two, you could easily tell me it's 4 because it's 3 minus a minus 1. So just break it down for yourself like that, and then it's not too intimidating. So our volume is going to be, I'm going to take the pi out again, because I'm revolving, so I need pi r squared. Now what are my bounds? I'm doing everything with y's now, so I need y bounds. Keep in mind, before we were going from 0 to 1, because we were adding up the x slices, but now we're going adding up the y slices, well, it just happens that this point here is 1, 1, right? y equals x, so this point would have to be 1, 1. So we're still going from 0 to 1, but remember, these are the y bounds. You must make sure that you're doing y bounds now. And so we're doing the radius outer minus the radius inner. I didn't write y plus 1, but that's what that is dy. And so now we need to simplify. y to the one-half times y to the one-half is just y. y minus 2y is minus y. So I have 1 minus a half is just a half, and that's my answer. 
So here's another illustration of let's take the area bounded between these two regions and let's revolve it around the x-axis here. And you can see that we get this as our resulting solid. And we can take that same exact region between these two curves and revolve it around the y-axis. And here is the shape that it will end up looking like. Bigger picture, the formula volume equals the integral from A to B of A of X dx can be applied to any solid for which the cross-sectional area A of X can be found. This includes solids of revolution, as we've seen, but also many other solids. Here is an illustration of our cross-sections idea. Let's take this apple here, and in order to approximate the volume of the apple, what we'll do is we'll slice it into all these little pieces, and we can find the radius of each individual slice, right? And if we were to add all of those up, that would be the idea of our cross-sections. And the more slices that we create, the better approximation to our actual that we get. Here is an actual AP problem that we're going to practice, mainly for part B, which is going to ask us to do this cross-sections type problem. But let's just go ahead and do the full problem while we're at it. And in this question here, note that you cannot use a calculator. So we're not going to be using a calculator. And they tell us that we have two curves, y equals root x and y equals x over 2. You don't have your calculator. You do need to be able to identify these. This should be pretty easy. y equals x over 2 must be just a straight line. So obviously that is this one. And I'm just going to write 1 half x because I'd rather write it like that. And then this, of course, is y equals root x. Excellent. So now to find the area of this region right here, that's what we did in the last section. And that would just be adding up all of these dx slices from 0 to 4, right? That's where we're adding them up from. And top would be root x minus the bottom curve would be 1 half x dx to evaluate that. I'm just going to rewrite that as x to the 1 half, so it's a little bit easier. And so now to evaluate it, add 1, add 1, divide by what I added up there, evaluate that between 0 and 4. So now I have 2 thirds. If I put in a 4, take the square root 2 cubed is 8 minus 4 squared minus, and now I'm just going to write 4 times 4 because I'm going to be dividing it by 4. Again, I don't have my calculator, so I don't want to do too much in my head. Those are going to cancel out. So I get 16 thirds minus 4, which is 12 thirds, 4 thirds. So now let the fun begin. This is what I really wanted to do this problem for. So in part B, it says the region R is the base of the solid. Okay, that's our base. And for this solid, the cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are squares. Okay, so I'm going to do this part in blue. So I'm just going to take here. That is the base of my square here. And it's a square, so that side is equal to that side, which is equal to all other four sides, right? And what is this length here? Well, this length is just root x minus 1 half x. And of course, this side is equal to this side because it's a square. And so the area of my square is root x minus 1 half x squared. Let me just go ahead and simplify that while I'm at it. Remember, I'm going to have to FOIL this. So I get x minus, let's see, what do I have? I have the outer would be 1 half x root x, and the inner would also be 1 half x root x plus one-fourth x squared. And if I combine like terms, I have minus one-half minus another half is just minus one of them. And then in order to find the volume, that's actually quite easy. 
the volume is just adding up from 0 to 4, because I'm doing dx slices, adding up all these areas. So once I can find the area of the square, that's all I have to do to find the volume, is add up all of those little slices. x minus, instead of writing x root x, I'm going to write x to the 3 halves, so that will be easier to take the antiderivative of. dx, now just take the antiderivative. So I have 1 half x squared minus, add 1 up there, plus x cubed, so that's going to be 1 twelfth, and I'm evaluating that between 0 and 4. And so again, because I'm going to have to simplify here, I'm going to just write 4 times 4 divided by 2, because see, that's going to simplify, minus 2 fifths times square root of 4 is 2, and then 2 to the 5th is 32, plus, I'm going to use that little trick again here, 4 times 4 times 4 divided by 12, because those will cancel and I'll have 3 left there. Just helps me simplify by thinking like that. So I have 8 minus 64 fifths plus 16 thirds, and honestly, if I was on the AP exam, you can just leave your answer just like that, and they'll give you full credit, but I'm just going to work it out. And so my common denominator here is going to be 15th. 8 times 15 is 120, minus 64 times 3 is 192, plus 16 times 5 is 80. So you should get 8 fifteenths there. In part C, they ask you to write, but do not evaluate, an integral expression for the volume of the solid generated when we rotate around the horizontal line y equals 2. So I'm going to do this part in green, so we're going to rotate around y equals 2 here. So let's just go ahead and draw in our radiuses. So I'm going to draw them in right here. So here is one of them and here is another one of them. So the longer one is my radius outer and I always have to do top which is 2 minus bottom. So 2 minus 1 half x and then this is the shorter so it's going to be radius inner. And again, I'm going to do top, which is 2, minus the bottom, so 2 minus x to the 1 half. And again, I'm just adding up dx slices between 0 and 4. So part C is the volume equals pi, add up from 0 to 4, now radius outer, 2 minus 1 half x squared, minus radius inner, 2 minus x to the 1 half, squared dx and that is all you have to do for part c now just as a little extension to do a little bit more of this cross-section practice let's take that same region but in part a let's pretend that our cross sections are semicircles so those semicircles are kind of just popping out at us there. And this picture is not the same picture as we have here, but I thought that would be a good illustration for you. Anyway, back to our problem here. So the semicircles are going to be popping up, right? But this right here is our diameter, okay? So I'm going to color code it. So this right here is our top curve minus our bottom curve. In other words, our root x minus 1 half x. And then our semicircle, of course, looks like this. But I just made this red because this red corresponds with exactly this red right here. So now, what is the area of our semicircle? A semicircle is 1 half pi r squared. So in this case, our radius is, this is a diameter, right? So our radius is going to be root x minus 1 half x all over 2 squared. Let's just simplify this a little bit. So I get 1 half pi and then I have this top part root x minus 1 half x squared and I'm going to square the bottom 
separately. Okay, so I just did the top squared over the bottom squared. And so now I'm just gonna take that four out just to make it look a little bit nicer. So I have pi over eight root x minus one half x, the whole thing squared. So I'm just gonna set it up in this question. I'm not going to actually evaluate the volume. So the volume would just be add up all the areas from zero to four again. So from zero to four, pi over eight root x minus one half x, that whole thing squared. And that's how I would set up the volume. Now in this case, in part B, again, this is our base. And now we have a rectangle with a height of five. So this is the base of our rectangle, right? And that's parallel to that. And then our height here is five in this case. Again, I'm coloring this because this is the base of our rectangle and that is just root x minus one half x. So what is the area of my rectangle? Well, the area of a rectangle is the base times the height. That's it. So I have five root x minus one half x. Maybe I would write five root x minus five halves x. And so what's the volume? I just add up all those cross sections again from zero to four. And this time, this is my area. So that's all you do. You add up all the areas. Do not confuse. In part C, for example, when we were rotating and revolving our solid, why did we have this pi? We had that pi because remember, we were doing pi r outer squared minus pi r inner squared. And that's how we were getting our little washer thing, right? And we were just adding up all of those from our a to our b. And then we were factoring our pi out because we said, hey, that's easier. But if we're doing the cross sections, all we do, we are literally just adding up all of the areas. So once you can find the area, the volume becomes a piece of cake. See, once you can find that area, the volume's a piece of cake. Again, once you can find that area, the volume is a piece of cake. So here, I'm not actually revolving around any axis. Here, you just really need to take a look at the cross section and think, what is the area of my cross section? And then you're adding up all of those areas. Here, this is my little cross section. I know that I have equilateral triangles as my cross section. A solid has a circular base of radius one. So I would just basically draw this circle here and say, all right, I have a circle with the radius of one. And so I know that my equation is y equals root 1 minus x squared, okay? Because x squared plus y squared equals 1 squared. A solid has a circular base of radius 1. Got that covered. And then I have parallel cross sections perpendicular to the base. So let's just go this way. I usually like to do dx slices unless I have to do otherwise. Um, and they're equilateral triangles. So I know that I have 60, 60, 60, and I know from my illustration here that base, so this is y and this is y, right? This is my y and this is my y. So each of my sides is actually 2y. And so what is my height? My height, because this is 2y. And this is 2y, this is y, then this is root 3y. Don't forget your 30, 60, 90. You need to know that. If this is x, then this is 1 half x, and this is root 3 over 2x. So I just applied that same logic here to get this height. And so I know that the area of my triangle is just 1 half base, so 1 half the base is just y, because my base would have been 2y, times root 3y, which is root 3y squared. And so my volume 
is just going to be adding up all of those areas between negative 1 and 1. The area, again, is root 3y squared. Now, notice I have dx and this is a y. That is bad, right? I need to replace my y squared with 1 minus x squared. Since I see symmetry here, I'm just going to go ahead and make this from 0 to 1 and make it 2. And I'm going to pull the root 3 out because it's a constant. And I've run out of room, so I'm just going to go down here. 2 root 3, take the antiderivative. And that's it. So what I did was I just added up all of my equilateral triangles between negative 1 and 1. Now they didn't draw it for us. We have to find the volume of a pyramid whose base is a square with side L and whose height is H. So I'm just going to draw a little axis so I make my life a little bit easier. And I want a pyramid. I'm going to just lie this pyramid down on my axis. So I'm going to just lie it down. I have a pyramid, kind of the side of my pyramid, and of course, you know, the pyramid would like go like that, and that would be my pyramid, but I just like to draw everything in, in 2D so I don't really confuse myself. So this base here is a square, okay? So my base, my cross section, my base is just a square. with the side of L. So this is L. This whole thing is L. My cross section, say, is right here. So I know that by the time I get to my cross section, this distance is X, and let's just go ahead and say this whole distance there is Y. So the whole thing is Y. So that's my little cross section, what I just drew in. In order to do this, I can kind of propose this ratio and say, well, if this is my length and ultimately this is my whole height of my pyramid, then the length to the height is the same as my y to my x. I will use that in order to say y equals L over h. So I'm going to use that because I know that I want to add up all of these little squares. And so the area, right, because I want to add up all the squares in order to get my, my pyramid, my full pyramid. This is just the same as my apple slices. I take it, make a bunch of little apple slices, and if I add up all the apple slices, I get my whole apple. Basically, in order to find the volume, I'm adding up all of them from zero to whatever height I'm at. I'm adding up all of these squares that I have. And so I need to, of course, get everything in terms of the x variable. So now I have a replacement. And so then I can just go ahead and do it. And of course the l and the h are both constant, so I can just pull that out. Then I take the antiderivative, and these cross out, so I just am left with a L squared H times one third, and that's my answer. Okay, so keep in mind we're just adding up these little squares.
and I needed this little conversion because I knew that each square, the area was y squared, but of course I needed everything in terms of x's, so I could do this conversion in order to figure that out. And that's it. There's also a method of cylindrical shells, and that's not actually on the AP exam, so I'm not going to cover it. Um, sometimes the dishwasher method is difficult for a solid of revolution, and so an alternative is to divide the solid into concentric circular cylinders. So basically when we were doing the dishwasher method, this was always, we used slices that are perpendicular to the axis you're revolving around. And in cylindrical shells, you pick your slices to be parallel. And so basically, this leads to really cool shapes. But what happens is, see, I'm revolving in this example. I'm trying to revolve around this axis. And so um, one way is to use the washer method to go this way like we've normally been using. I would have used dy slices because that's perpendicular to the axis I'm trying to revolve around. The problem here is that in order to use dy slices, I have to solve for x, and I don't know how to solve this thing for x. So an easier method would be to use the shells method, which we're not gonna do again, but you just pick these slices to be parallel to the axis you're rotating around. So instead of getting like a washer looking thing, you actually get this thing that we call a shell. And the 3D of it looks awesome. But unfortunately, we're not going to do that. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, whichever one you're thinking right now after this long lesson. So we can close here. That's it. We'll do a lot of practice of this in class.